Due to the weather this weekend, we've had a change in plans, in more ways than one. Something has come up, and I'm going to end up headed to Edgewater regardless. Well, guys, this hurricane has got everything screwed up for us this weekend. I had planned on taking the 55 this weekend down to Edgewater and uh, racing it in 650 index. But, of course, uh, rain all weekend from this hurricane has washed everything out. So, I am still headed to Edgewater today, though. Even though the track's not open, I've got a special project I'm working on. It's been about a year ago now since Rob Winley, the owner of Edgewater Sports Park down in Cincinnati, contacted me and asked me for some recommendations on rule changes to some heads up classes for small tire racing at Edgewater. To be completely honest, I was hoping that Rob would find somebody else to help him. It's no secret that I haven't been real happy with the direction that no prep small tire racing has gone the last four years. Now, over the last several months, the car counts have been dwindling and so have the number of spectators at Edgewater. And this is a major problem because for the last four or five years, the no prep races have brought in a lot of money that has allowed small family owned tracks like Edgewater to reinvest back into the facility and make some much needed improvements. But unfortunately, over the last two years, a lot of radial racers have discovered their four second eighth mile cars can run local no preps and win races versus your average street race car without really having to lean on their engines and typically end up racing for a lot more money than they would at their average radial race. So recently they split small tire up into two different classes with two separate names. Don't get confused on the names. One is for tube chassis cars and one is for non-tube chassis cars basically. Um, there's a couple other rules like no billet heads, no boosted big blocks and a couple other things. But we're in the, the, I guess you could say the slower, more limited class. When small tire no prep racing first started to take off here in central Ohio, the events were intended to bring street race cars off the street that had absolutely no interest in bracket racing. Because back then, bracket racing was the only thing that local tracks offered. Although there were some heads up races for radial cars, it was the pacemakers cash days races that Billy and I put on that really put Ohio on the map as a street race car venue. But honestly, it wasn't just street cars. It was street bikes as well. Although Billy and I had no background in promoting, the reputation of his S10 pickup truck and other well-known local street racers like CJ Buckner and his Raggedy Ann Mustang brought the event's credibility and brought more and more street racers in. But it didn't take long to realize there were going to be some promotional challenges ahead. It looks like a pro bond, it is a fucking pro bond. When the radial guys saw street race cars coming in the front gate, it was like blood in the water. Fast forward to today, and a lot of those same challenges that we had back then are the same challenges that track owners and promoters face today. And so Rob Winley, the owner of Edgewater Sports Park, has asked me to come down and meet with him today to go over some ideas on ways to make the track and the events more profitable while trying to educate people on the difficulties of keeping the track open. It's all part of it. Part of life. You just open the gates and you collect the money. Exactly. That's easy. It's easy, isn't it? <laughs> Friday comes, you open the gate, you collect the money. <laughs> Typically, the racers only see the track when the weather is nice and the track is open. So on those Friday and Saturday nights when everyone's here having a good time, the last thing anyone thinks about are the other five days of the week when the track isn't making any money or when Mother Nature isn't playing nicely. So I told Rob this would be a good opportunity to have a conversation about what it's like to own and operate a drag strip in today's economy especially so your dad used to run this track for 40 years 40, uh, years. 40 years and he passed away how long passed ago passed away uh december of uh, 2019. okay so it's not been very long no this is uh season five season five for you yep. so as you were growing up did you ever like did you think this is what i'm going to do when i always felt that um someday i would i would run the racetrack so uh, I was 30 years in the car business and felt like it was time to make a move. So uh, after my dad passed away, I closed down everything with the car dealership in July of 20 and then uh, took this over full time. And here we are five years later. This place is a lot of maintenance. It's a ton of maintenance. Just, uh, just the grass cutting alone is uh, a major undertaking every week. Um, my brother, Jerry, is a real stickler about appearances and making things good and making sure there's no grass along the walls and we did it around all the fence posts that's a lot holes and that is a lot of work. the grass and I, I can assure you that grass grows fast <laughs> <laughs> plus i mean you've got the maintenance down here i mean my god just we're here today the 
shingles are blown off. There's there's porta johns dumped over. All the trash cans are dumped over. There's stuff blown off the walls. The fence is blown down out there out front. There's tree limbs down. It never stops. This place is only open one or two days a week, but the rest of the days of the week, it doesn't stop. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's amazing. You're running a grounds keeping business. You've got a maintenance business because you got to do main, you know the sprayer for the for the glue and making oh, sure yeah. everything's together and you know, cutting the tires for the drag and getting those prepared. So how much is a drum of glue to spray the track? By the time um, you ship it and uh, spray it down, a tractor and everything, you're going to run about fifteen hundred bucks a barrel. A barrel. Okay. And how many of those do you use? In a month to prep a quarter mile track um, and maintain it um, for a day you're going to use a barrel so with like, we had streetcar takeover a couple weeks ago and those two days we went through four barrels oh my god just uh, just to keep the track tight enough to have that radial style racing so when you have no prep it's kind of yeah it's kind of nice you, you, can, you, don't, <laughs> you don't have that expense added yeah. to, the, to the cost of it. right Although most people today are familiar with Edgewater as a quarter mile drag strip, the track has hosted other events like music concerts, like this one from September of 1975 that featured the Eagles, as well as the Marshall Tucker Band, REO Speedwagon, and others. Indeed, there is a lot of history here at Edgewater Sports Park with the Winley family. And with over 45 years of family tradition, it's extremely difficult for Rob to even consider walking away. Rob's father, Dick Winley, who ran this track for 40 years, dearly loved it and dearly loved drag racing. And although we see just another drag strip when we walk in, when Rob walks in, he feels his father's presence everywhere. So remember when we were first in the office, I showed you that picture, it was black and white and it hit the three cars, there's the apricot, apricot brandy that was on the trailer. It's very easy for me to see the deep rooted connection that Rob has not only to his family and his father, but also to what his father left behind. But in today's economy, with sky high soaring inflation, it's never been more difficult to hang on to. One of the, one of the things we do whenever we have one of the um, incandescent bulbs go out, we replace it with an LED bulb and it's a thousand bucks a pop. A thousand dollars a piece for light bulbs? Um, they, you know, eventually it pays off after I don't know how many years, so hopefully these LEDs last, last as long as they say they're going to, <laughs> to get them to actually pay off. So what about like the timing system, like the scoreboards, all that's maintenance? All that's maintenance, just replacing the bulbs and just keeping everything uh, just in working order is, is, is a job just there. There's a company, Dactronics, that does has all the, the system that powers um, the scoreboards, and that's all linked in with our new AccuTime system. Uh -huh. Not sure how Rusty does it, but he got it all figured out for us when he came in and put the new system in. So you were telling me you were thinking about putting new scoreboards up, but uh... yeah, we want to. That's on my wish list. Um, <laughs> I want to. I want to put in green LED scoreboards, or you know, God, God, have the the money to do it like Norwalk does, and have the the winning <laughs> one is green and the losing one is red. So it's real easy for you to know which uh, right. which one's which. And they need to they need to get a little taller too. So we're going to have to have new I beams and everything. But the scoreboards alone are like forty grand. About forty grand just for oh the, my the, god! Uh, you know the cost of installing them, and you got to rent a crane, and you know all that just to just to have the new scoreboards. And then, so many people now have got stackers and really tall stuff that park along the fence here to be able to have people see from the stands. We need to go up about ten more feet oh. as well. So then it's going to have to be pouring more concrete. And put bigger Never even thought of that. Yeah, yeah, because the people in the stands down there now can't see the scoreboards because the yeah. the stackers and the motorhomes are getting taller. And taking out, you know, wiring and stuff like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it never ends. We had our electric power taken out by a stacker earlier this year from that goes from the oh my session gosh. over to the tech shed. So. We haven't gotten that fixed yet. So that's, on, that's, on the, that's on the list. So. The fact of the matter is, everything at the track has a lifespan. Everything from the flag on the flagpole to the shingles on the roof. With the most expensive thing being the track surface itself. So how old is the track surface here? Well, um, we had concrete um, before I took over from the starting line through the 8th. And then in, in 2020, uh, we took what we had in working capital from my father and put in new new um, concrete all the way from the eighth all the way through about 100 feet past the, uh, the uh, finish line. And 
We also put in water boxes. We replaced all that concrete as well. How much did all that cost? And that was uh, roughly about 325000 And how long ago was that? That was, uh, this is five years now. Five years ago. And the clock's ticking on everything here from the, the shutdown blacktop yep. to the return roads to the staging lanes, like... It's, it's constant maintenance, like most racetracks are on floodplain, and we sit on all this gravel and bank run and everything else, and it just, it shifts just a little bit. Now, especially if we get flood, it always starts at the bottom of the racetrack and comes up, and that'll get in there, and that'll move the base mm -hmm. around a little bit, and you start getting cracks and fissures in, in the asphalt, so we're gonna have to address that at some point here soon as well. And this thing is sitting right next to a gravel pit. Correct. And we don't want the gravel pit to continue that, <laughs> this direction. That is, that is Because the obviously this ground is worth a considerable amount of money to the right person who has a sand and gravel pit right next door. Correct. They, uh, buy it by the acre and sell it by the, uh, the ton. So there's constant pressure. There's constant pressure. Um, you know, as inflation goes up, you know, the, the value of the property goes up along with that. And then, right. Um, because the cost of materials goes up. Materials goes so up. the sand and the gravel that this place is sitting on continuously goes up in value. So my number one focus is try to get this place to be worth more as a track, as, as, a track, as an entertainment facility rather than as a gravel pit. I don't want to come back here, you know, 10 years and have it be a lake like the 40 acres that we sold off back uh, about 20 years ago. So your dad sold that off? Yeah. I got you. We don't want to continue to sell off. No. You want to continue to I run wanna, as a track? I want to continue to be a track, yeah. That's my goal. So we need to come up with some new ideas. Yes. To market. <laughs> to market and uh, need to have, you know, I've since 20, I've implemented a lot of uh, big events that have, that have been successful that are uh, money generating events that we've got, you know, the income to do the repairs and the maintenance that needs to be done on the racetrack to make it an even better, uh, more user-friendly facility for the racers themselves as well as the spectators. Right. Now, you know, no prep, when it really started to get hot five or six years ago, that was a huge cash influx. But yeah. now it's got to the point where it's so watered down, there's so many people doing it. It's hard. Yeah, it's saturated. There's just every racetrack has them, and um, you know we, everybody, unfortunately, and ourselves probably do it more than we should um, to have that that revenue. In. Um, and everyone's pretty much doing it the same way. Everybody's doing it the same way. It's kind of kind of been a rut and uh, a lot of shatter in the community. Um, that there's so much money come into no prep racing. It's driving all the street tire street racers the old style guys away right uh, you just can't compete with you know guys that are buying you know it's the import versus import versus the world cars and converting those to uh, no prep race cars you just you just can't compete with that type of bankroll when then they've got the best people to tune the cars and the best experienced drivers oh, yeah. and everything else and, it just, and it's progressed and there's nothing wrong with that no not at all but uh, the everyday guys like like that we used to cater to five or six years ago, you don't see those cars here anymore. No, you don't. Because they just can't compete. Yeah, people don't want to just come and, and donate money to the cause. They want to have a chance to, right. um, you know, a chance to you, win the money, you know, and right. have fun. And you, At least feel like they've got a shot to go correct. a few rounds. Correct, exactly. Now, my big thing is, you know, in the last few years, it's gone to backsides or airports mm -hmm. or really bad surfaces. But the thing that the problem is with that, like if you did a backside here, all of your infrastructure is centered around the front side of the Correct. track. There's no stands. There's no restrooms. There's no concession stands. Like I know Milan does one and they've probably got the best backside race I've ever been to. But the other thing is the lanes are never the same. And I think some of that has to do with the way the, the lanes were paved, the way the screed goes down one way and they turn around and come back the other way. The tracks that we've been to to run backsides, one lane is always two or three tenths faster than the other. Yep. Yes. Every time. Every track you're around, you're gonna have lane, one lane is better than the other. But at least here on a front side, 
they're it's, a little closer. It's oh, they're a lot closer. So the other thing is, is when you do that, you don't have the tree, you don't have the timing system, you don't have wind lights. And so you can't do index racing. And index racing is a big part of how we're growing the sport of no prep. Correct. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's really the only classes that actually pay for themselves. Um, all your small tire stuff, that's all spectator paid. You yeah. Know? In the bracket world, it's entries that pay the right. purse. But in the small tire world, you're gonna be, it's the spectators that are coming in that pay that purse. And um, we need to do something that makes it special again. You know, it was new and different. Now it's so saturated and it's, it's being done so much that uh, we really need to dip our toes into something new and different. Maybe go back to our roots a little bit and maybe um, find, a, find that special draw. I spent most of the day on Sunday going over some event ideas, and although I've still got a lot left to put together, I have to keep things moving here at the shop as well. And so the one project I've got that's been on the back burner for a long time has now moved front and center. It's finally happening. Finally. Finally. So main thing today, I think, just get the transmission and the engine pulled out of it, and that way maybe tomorrow we can start cleaning up the frame and the firewall yeah. and, you know. But one thing I do need you to do before we get too far into this, is paint that freaking fan. You want it back to black? Yeah. I can just put this one on. Since it's finally time to V8 swap the El Camino, Tanner's gonna work on that today while Billy works on Molly's Supra, replacing the transmission. So while those projects are going on back at the house, up at the machine shop, Bob's waiting on me to come up and help him dyno test the 502 Big Block Ford, and I need to take some video of the new 496 giveaway engine. We're getting ready to start the giveaway on this evening. But during the 45 minute drive up to the machine shop, I've got a little bit of time to think about what I need to do for this race. Well, we had a really good meeting down at Edgewater and I've come up with some ideas and Rob and I are working on this deal. I think it's gonna be really good. I'll have some more details for you probably by the end of this video. I'm pretty excited about it. it uh, it's been four or five years since I tried to promote anything or host any races. Uh, the last time was uh, I think in 2020 when COVID hit. That whole year was just wrecked. The no prep thing did a lot for a lot of people for a long time, but uh, it's it's gotten so watered down and there's so many people doing it and they're all doing it the same way. And gotten really, really difficult for tracks to, uh, to have a successful event. Instead of trying to do another no prep race, Rob and I are looking at maybe doing something similar to the very popular Thursday night lights races they used to have back at Edgewater about six years ago. There were multiple reasons why these events were so successful, but there were also some things that needed to be changed, such as the arm drop starts that always led to drama. I seen her hand move and then he moved. Hold on. The hand moves. What eye are you looking at? I can tell you that any event that I promote at Edgewater will definitely not have arm drop racing nor instant green, but everything will be run on either a four tenths or five tenths pro tree. Anyway, now that I'm back at the machine shop, it's time to get busy. The big block Ford's ready in the dyno room and Bob's got the 496 short block assembled in the assembly room. Hey, this thing's starting to look pretty good. We're gonna start that giveaway tonight. I think at midnight, Vicky's got all the stuff downloaded onto the website. It's not live yet, but whole bunch of new merch. She's pretty excited about that. We need to get the rest of the parts. So I know, we got to get this going. We need an intake manifold. We need an oil pan yet. Uh, the camshaft, is it here? No. no. Uh oh, I better call Nolan, find out where our cams are. Cause he owes me one for that Ford in there too. Yeah, he was supposed to be sent on a couple weeks ago. So it's ready to fire up on the dyno? Yep. So Bob's got water in this thing. He fired it up uh, last week, I think last Friday, fired it up and uh, timing set at about 30 degrees. Okay.
All right, so we got that Ford fired up, put a little heat in it in there. I noticed it's got a little lean spot in it when you kick the throttle open. And I think part of that probably stems from the fact that that engine uh, is tuned or maybe has been tuned to those little teeny tiny headers and the exhaust system that's on it. Uh, I had to richen up the idle mixture screws a little bit uh, because it was so lean at an idle. And although it did not completely take care of that lean spot, uh, that's probably gonna require a jet change or power valve adjustment. But uh, it's important to remember that this thing is used to running with those little tiny headers and the full exhaust system on it. And that way in the car, it probably wouldn't run too bad. However, the ignition timing primarily is pretty low. The ignition timing uh, at idle is only 20 degrees. So it is a little bit lazy. There again, with the smaller headers and exhaust, it might not bother it so much. But here on the dyno with the big tube headers, you know, it's not quite the same as what you know, you'd expect it to run like in the car. The main reason that this engine is here is because the owner feels like it may have some valve train problems that need to be taken care of. So the first thing we're going to do is make a pull on this engine exactly the way it came out of the car. All right, so it made really good power, 558, 622 foot-pounds of torque, uh, but it's definitely not happy. I called John Menarchik, the guy that owns this car and this engine, and he said at 5,700 it would lay over, and that's exactly what it just did on the dyno. So I don't know. The timing's not locked out in it like it probably should be for the cam that's in it. And you can hear like when we start to make the dyno pull, uh, down low, it's not happy, and then all of a sudden you can hear the RPMs just start to climb, and I think that's when the ignition timing comes in. Um, and I don't know what the ignition timing is at wide open. It's got a stock balancer, stock pointer, and it's hard to tell where the timing's going because it seems like it just keeps adding and adding and adding and adding as the RPMs climb, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to use the up button on the timing on the timing light trying to keep up with it and it's just difficult to do um, but I think what we'll probably do is just lock the ignition timing out put a fresh set of plugs in it and put it on race gas probably not pump gas it just I don't think it likes pump gas at all and John said that when he used to run it in the car he'd run it on a 50 50 mix and he said it didn't like pump gas in the car either so that's our starting point, 550 some horsepower and it's unhappy, 558 horsepower and it's unhappy. Well, Squirrely, are you about ready to start this giveaway? I am working so hard. <laughs> you have been working so hard. For days. For days. Yes. Getting all the merch downloaded to the internet, all the pictures sorted, mm -hmm. descriptions. There's, there's a lot of new stuff. Like, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> I'm almost ready. Five more minutes. Okay. So Vicky's back there working on the computer. She's just about ready to turn all this new merch loose on you guys. Well, she's working on that. Let's go out here in the shop for a minute. Uh, so this weekend, I plan on going to National Trail Raceway because it's the uh, Jack's Wax Street Madness event, the Halloween edition. And I always like to go to that. I'm gonna take Billy's 55 down, make some passes in it. And I might even take the old 69 C10 down there and put it on display. Although I don't know, uh, it doesn't have exhaust and it's extremely loud the way it is. Uh, we've got the engine and transmission pulled out of Vicky's El Camino up in the front shop. Pretty excited about that. So we're gonna get started putting the 327 back down in it. Hopefully tomorrow we'll get started on that. We'll see how that goes. But we got a lot going on with this event <laughs> at Edgewater. Uh, I've got some details to drop on you here. As soon as Vicki gets done, we'll talk about it. Are we ready? I think so. All right, let's do this. Do you notice anything different about me? Your hair's pretty fluffy. That's oh. pretty good considering I got rained on. Yeah, I can tell you got Look. rained on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look. Look at this. Yeah, I see it. It's the same as this. Look what I snuck in. <laughs> I have 
Spent a lot of time planning out this shirt. At last. How cool is that? The male Camino shirt. Yeah. I'm going to be going so fast soon, the male's going to be flying out the back. Yeah, with your 327. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this stuff. Yeah, so we have new stuff coming up. One of them is this. It'll be in a t-shirt or a hoodie. Uh, there's the new Legendary Power 496 shirt that you designed. Yes. Very cool. There's a new 55 design. It's Driven by Freedom. Very cool shirt, kind of a patriotic feel. Um, there's going to be some new glitter stuff. There's a new We the People tumbler, like very patriotic right now with the election coming up. Like, you're going to love it. Decals are back. We haven't had decals in like a year. Red OMG shirts are back. We haven't had those in a long time. Flannels. It's that time of year. Now, mm -hmm. some of this stuff is pre-order because we oh. don't have all this. Yeah, it's all pre-order. We are going to, you know, be patient. You know how these go. Pre-order, probably about three weeks, give or take. Okay. So, everybody be patient. It starts October 1st. What starts? This giveaway for the 496 Big Block. You're so all over the place. Am I? Yes, okay, very much. Okay, so the 496 <laughs> Big Block Chevy Pump Gas Engine Giveaway starts tonight. Yeah. So, so every order gets you an entry into yes. the giveaway for the 496 big block Chevy pump gas motor that we are currently building up at the machine shop. Yes. And so from October 1st, clear through November 25th, and then we are going to draw the winner the day before Thanksgiving. Okay. That's yeah. pretty freaking cool. That is. Yeah. So all that stuff's uploaded to the website. You can go to the old man's garage dot shop mm -hmm. and that's where you, that's where you pick up your merch mm -hmm. and we're going to draw the winner. On what date? The day before Thanksgiving. Yeah. So you've got almost <laughs> two months. Almost. Just shy of two months. And uh, I have some even more stuff that's coming down the pike that's still in the design process. But okay. right now, even there's a bunch of new stuff already. So Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about this race we're going to do at Edgewater. Oh. Yeah. So Friday night is going to be a lifted and lowered car meet. Mm -hmm with a test and tune all night. Anyone and everyone's welcome, no matter what it is. But there's gonna be a burnout contest that pays a thousand dollars to win. That's a lot. Yeah. You're gonna... <laughs> so listen, 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 listen. This is not gonna be like any other burnout contest because most of the time it's one car at a time. This is going to be two cars at a time. Okay. And they're gonna be drawn out of the chip bag, just like small tire. All right, so two cars pull in and they each start doing their burnout. And they're doing a burnout for 60 seconds. And the crowd gets to vote on the winner between each pairing. Wow. So then the one with the most crowd reaction gets to come back and yes. do it again. So, yeah. So if you're rolling in there with a clapped out uh, four-door Crown Vic and you get paired up, with a big lifted truck with rock lights and, you know, 24 inch wheels, you're probably going to have to have somebody there to cheer you on, <laughs> you know? I mean, unless it can do a heck of a burnout. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, so there's going to be rounds to this. There's going to be four rounds to win. We're going to take 32 and in two weeks, Rob Winley at Edgewater is going to put the entries up for pre-sale 32 only. That's all we're going to take is 32. I'm glad because I was thinking when you said you have $1,000 on this, you're going to have people from. <laughs> That's Friday night. We haven't gotten into Saturday yet. Okay. Oh my gosh. So Friday night lifted okay. and lowered. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just test and tune. Night. Yeah. It's a car okay. meet test and tune with a thousand dollar to win 32 car burnout competition. Wow. Now it could be cars. It could be trucks. It could be Jeeps. It could be front wheel drives, so imports. Could all those race on Friday night too? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. hundred oh, so percent. I said a test and tune. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> all right. So now this weekend, we have the Jack's Wax Street Madness event at National Trail Raceway. It's the Halloween edition. Yes. I love it because there's tons of little kids in their Halloween costumes trick-or-treating. Stop by and see me because I'm going to have candy. If you're bringing a car to show, bring some candy to hand I'm bringing out. the 55 to make yeah. some passes. And then That's I'm also fun. probably going to bring the 69C10 to put it on display for Billy. And if my El Camino happens to have a 327 in it. Well, we'll, we'll see. That's a long ways away. <laughs> We'll see what happens. All right. So come see us this yes, weekend, National Trail Raceway. Mm -hmm. It's Saturday. I don't know what it is. $20 to get in or something like I that. Know, uh, 
it's the $20. Dates open at four. Um, and the boys, they're not, they're still undecided where for sure they're racing, but I know for sure Jack Swax, me and Bill will be there. Okay. So that's it. That's it. That's all. It's all part of it. Part of life. You just open the gates and you collect the money. Exactly. That's easy. It's easy, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Friday comes, we open the gate and collect the money. <laughs>